Now, I thought the most useful thing I can do for you now is to talk about your lives. So I'm going to be talking about yes. future-proofing yourself against climate change. And we have all the extinction rebellion types, all the climate change groups, the low carbon groups and so on. That's fine, that's theoretical, but this affects me how? This affects each one of you, some more profoundly than others. In Cambridge, your city council, you, you have major challenges. You obviously flood a lot. This is the flood map of, of Cambridge, you know. I mean, if anybody has a house in the floodplain, my only advice to you would be move. It's not going to get better if you're yourself. But if you look at the actual strategy, they have six strategies on mitigation, more energy efficiency. They have one point on adaptation. And yet we're getting into the stage where adaptation is really where we should be putting a lot more effort. We're in the middle of a European heat wave. Across today and tomorrow, they're expecting 50 degrees centigrade in Madrid. And around the world, and Australia, India, these records are being broken. And here we have the, the first big warning about the scale of the challenges we face. You can see this outlier here, which is the 2003 heat wave. 52,000 people died, many on the top floors. You really have to look at that top floor flat here in your building because they're very vulnerable under poorly insulated roofs. Really, the point is here. By 2050, that is going to be a cool summer. So this is what I want to talk about is heat in your own buildings. Okay. I'm not talking about engineering comfort that is delivered through a duct. As a product, it's produced and sold by engineers to a customer. That's how you make money out of putting machines in buildings. buildings. Comfort is extremely complex. Now, all of us, it's rather interesting. It's a warm evening here, and we have the body language of you all telling me you're all wearing different levels of clothing and so on. But here we have Sebastian here. Actually, he's chilly. He's a very tall, thin man. You know, perhaps it, he just needs to conserve. Whereas here, we splayed out, <laughs> shirt on, no jacket. Continually in your life, you are consciously or subconsciously and voluntarily um, reacting to the temperatures you occupy. So you'll be using posture or where you position yourself, um, how much activity you do and so on. And then, of course, there's the physiology of comfort, which is when you sweat, when you shiver and so on. But actually, for many of us, comfort is to feel safe and secure. And in every different climate, you'll have a different language for it too. We have the, the, the recent book on Higgy from Denmark, where you're cozy and you've got the family around you and there's lots of candles and the fire and so on. And in through um, Arabic speaking world, you know, when you're lying out on a balcony, it's hot outside and it's the cool breezes. And these are all different views of comfort. There is no such thing as a single comfort temperature. Now, I was working earlier this year in Antarctica. It's like five degrees centigrade. I had eight layers on, and suddenly Carlos comes jogging across the site. He's got jeans and T-shirt. This is very different. And here we have the common thing. I don't know if any of you suffer from having a, a picky wife who insists on having the thermostat at a different temperature from you in winter. And you can see these two on the right. She's wearing a light, attractive dress. You know, he's in a large, heavy woolen suit. They're, they're very different feelings and sensations. So, so you're looking at the social, the different roles of genders and, and so on in this um, equation of comfort. You'd be very surprised at how important emotion is in whether you're feeling comfortable or not. Now, this is where emotion is sensed in the body. If you're elderly, you live alone, you have no community around you, and you're depressed, you will feel substantially colder at the same temperature than if you're in a community situation. 
meeting houses like this are profoundly important for so many different aspects of health and your life. Do men and women feel comfort the same? Well, actually, a recent meta-analysis of the global data sets on this actually show similar response. Women, apparently, according to the data, um, are more sensitive to changes, but it might be that they're wearing less. And here we have um, a study in Qatar recently. But look at the different assemblages that the ladies are wearing. So we have the Arabic ladies, wearing sort of full um, coverings, and, and yet the Westerners in a t-shirt and skirt or something. So, and this is the, the blind fiddler, Walter Scott, in his Waverley novels, as he goes over into to Scotland, he, he complains about these poor children wearing no shoes and inadequate clothes. And look, she, she looks rather all huddled up because she's very, very cold. But different cultures do have different approaches. But what we've done in comfort studies is look at actually what temperatures are people occupying in their own homes. Now this is Pakistani data. And we have five different cities in Pakistan. I don't know if any of you know it. Multan is a um, hot desert. Saidu Sharif, which is right up near Afghanistan, is the, the sort of coldest place. But these are... The, the recorded temperatures in our trial homes. And you can see that every single city, it'll be a bit like Edinburgh versus Bristol, by over a year, people in those houses will occupy much more different temperatures. It's people adapt to those temperatures they normally occupy. And if they're not comfortable, then they change the environment around them or themselves. We go from about 10 to 35. People in their own homes around the world will find anything acceptable within those levels. Now, here we have, these are big data sets for the UK in winter, and then the UK in summer. Then we have Japanese data sets here, and we have Saudi Arabia, which goes up to about 35. And you can see um, Fergus, who I work with, Nicole, um, we've done all these big studies, and basically, Anything between 10 to 35 is, is quite reasonable. And you think, 10 degrees centigrade, golly, that must be a bit chilly. This is what British people in their own homes, this is a, a set from UCL of 472 houses, um, data sets over time. And people in different homes, in, this is English homes, sorry, um, will occupy a whole range of temperatures. You probably know some people who've got very hot houses or some people who have very cold houses. Um, and you think, how do they manage? But, but they adapt, you know, they just learn to wear thicker, you know, merino underwear or, or something like that. And there's a lot of variation in that. What they did then, this is David Shipworth at UCL, um, you actually reduce the actual patterns in that into thermal heartbeats for different house types. And you have here, you can see exactly what somebody's doing here. There, <laughs> overnight, the heating's off. Then 7.30, suddenly the heating will go on. And it might be that they have the heating on all day and then turn off in the evening. You have some people who will turn the heating on for a bit during the day and then leave it off on during the morning, leave it off, and then turn it on at night. You know, we all have different regimes of heating our houses. These are sort of general heartbeats for the buildings here. There is a thermoneutral zone, right, in which, because the function of our thermoregulatory system is to keep ourselves safe, and you've got a deep body temperature of... Yeah, 37. Okay, so that's 37.4. Okay, it's high, isn't it? 37.4. And there is a, um, a, a, a range of four, five, six degrees, depending on the person, in the middle, 
where their bodies neither sweats, uses energy to sweat, or uses energy to shiver, to get them warmer. These are the types of physiological mechanisms. And sort of roughly in the middle, it's about the same temperature that we sleep in, in an, uh, around our body. Somewhere in the middle of that thermoneutral zone. Has anybody got any idea what the range of those temperatures where the body's not expending any energy to keep warm or keep cool? I mean, we've all been persuaded by a generation of HIVAC engineers that you, you're comfortable at much lower temperatures, really. And in America it was, you know, so basically you obviously sell more air conditioning if you, I mean, have to cool something down to 20 degrees centigrade. Actually, our thermo neutral zone roughly swings 29 to 30. Yep. Each individual will vary very much on your body mass and so on, but this is sort of a general population thing. But when you go to sleep, between you and your uh, duvet, if you've got nothing better to do at night, stick a thermometer in there. And you'll find that it's roughly 29 to 30 between you and the blankets. Because that's, you know, sort of naked thing. It's higher than you thought, isn't it? Yeah? yeah. Um, and obviously, everything below that, when you, there's shivering bits, you just put on a jumper or a cardigan. And you'll, I mean, you just add more and more clothes on the, hot, on the cold side until you get down to 10. You can be quite comfortable in that. Um, sorry, if you're adapted and it's in a known pathway. But then if you're going up into the shivering bit, um, you get to the stage where it's rather embarrassing. To, you can't take any more clothes off. So that's when you, the fans kick in and you need more. Um, the just sweating. Yeah, yeah. It's the only way you can get cooler at the high end. So you've got clothing at the lower end, sweating at the higher end. This is just sort of normal. I did find out from my DNA that I am, I have more, more Neanderthal in me than 87% of the measured population. <laughs> I'm 3.1% Neanderthal. <laughs> yeah, respect. Um, okay, so what do people find comfortable? So we've seen that in Multan you'll be quite, you know, in a, in a house where it's maybe 30 degrees centigrade indoors in uh, Saidu Sharif or Chitral, you might be comfortable where it's 15 degrees inside at different seasons. So what are the rules? How do we design a comfortable building? Um, people like a steady, they like a known path, thermal pathway. So people can adapt to a whole range of temperatures and your mean monthly temperature sensation is virtually independent of the mean outdoor air temperature. So you can be perfectly happy in a, in a high temperature or a low temperature if you've got used to it and know you can deal with it. Discomfort over a month is caused by too great a departure. So you might get really hot in your house tomorrow because it's been quite cold for the whole of the month, hasn't it? But suddenly it jumps 10 degrees centigrade. And you think, oh my God, I'm dying, I'm dying. But if that same temperature came at the end of a long hot month, right? You might think, oh, this is beautifully cool. So temperatures in, in autumn feel very different from temperatures in spring. If you, in extreme, you go into extremely cold regions, you actually uh, deposit gray adipose fat tissues um, where you can store extra energy um, to, to give you heating boosts. And, and so there are that's a good point, yes. The, the body is incredibly clever. But the one really, so we don't like um, departure from the currently normal temperatures over a month. But during a day, people have been shown they don't like it being hot, cold, hot, cold, take your cardigan off, put it on, uh, move, the sun's come out, you know. So what you don't want is just um, to, to um, sort of a friskier temperature indoors. So um, if you have a fully air-conditioned building, say 
it's, there's a range of about 4 degrees centigrade. You can adapt to 4 degrees, 2 plus, 2 minus, getting hotter and colder over a day with hardly noticing, taking no actions. And then about 8 degrees, you can just about absorb. Yeah. But if you've got a comfortable building in, at the temperature that's appropriate in that place and time, then you've got that 4 degree band. But with an air-conditioned building, the, the, the building can get very hot or very cold, but you don't notice it because you've got the air conditioning kicks in. So sometimes with some passive design features, you'll lower a blind or raise a blind or do that semi-passively. And in a deeply passive building, you, you've got a building that does the work for you, not the machine, and that will give you a really stable indoor temperature. Why does this matter to you? Many, many modern British homes at the moment are heating, overheating really badly. Uh, do any of you live in modern homes? No? One. Yeah. Do you have overheating problems? Modern schools projects were uh, a disgrace. I mean, there's one Bradford school where one of the girls doing the exam, summer exams fainted from heat. They were getting so hot, you know. There is an endemic and chronic problem there. So how did we get to that? Where, what, where does this come from? Yeah? I mean, you look at the 20th century vernacular. Now how many, most of us live in older buildings, don't we? And a va uh, vernacular which was climate savvy, you know, developed, adapted to the local climate and conditions, yeah? And then we went through the Bauhaus and the modern movement, and this whole language changed. And this was at the age when energy was going to be too cheap to meter. So we got these whole new paradigms. Concrete, I mean, how many brutalist modern concrete buildings are still occupied? Because they're absolutely, you know, a thin concrete wall like that it is um, impossible to heat. Hang on here. Suddenly we had an energy crisis in the 70s. And, you know, the, the oil was drying up and energy was, prices were doubling, tripling, quadrupling. And we got this whole new sort of passive solar, solar buildings. Here's one from New Zealand, Australia, America. Um, the solution was going to be solar buildings. And that was really the 70s to the 80s. Uh, and we were talking about the Vales House earlier, which is a, a wonderful example. And the Cambridge was in the forefront here, wasn't it? Yeah. And then we got to the 90s. Oh, everything was about energy efficiency. And I'm always, I'm always about 10 years ahead, so I get the book out early, right? <laughs> energy efficiency. So what were we looking at? We're basically looking at the passive house. We're looking at better windows. So you put in the double glazing. You're look, putting it more insulation. You're getting rid of cold bridging. And you're getting rid of drafts. And then you put a little heat, you know, like um, heat recovery system in or something. That's basically the mantra of the passive house, OK? Okay, cold bridging. You see these metal windows here? Because metal is such a good conductor um, that all the heat in this room will be leaking out into the atmosphere through cold bridges. So um, what they do in modern types of really efficient windows is they make it of timber or something that won't heat. Okay. And this was, this, this was the Passive House, which is a huge product, which is sold most places. Um, and here's an early, the, that house, whatever, how you, how you pronounce that. Um, and the idea was that you get more solar gain from the south facing windows than you need in heating over the year. Has anybody spotted the floor here? Yeah. So well, it's all the heat gains are in summer and all the heat losses are in winter. That seemed to sort of slip their little minds. But it was a nice big south-facing windows. It came from Bavaria. 
and a problem was really quite chronic overheating. And, and that's the basic model of many modern buildings. They even sell them because they've got passive houses, passive house that. And um, it, it's fundamentally um, possibly um, challenging. It's definitely overheating. And look at this one. I mean, that's, this, is, this is a classic, um, the, pass, the biggest passive house building in Britain. It's a hospital. No opening windows. I mean, you can feel how it would feel inside, can't you? You just look at it, and you can feel it. No, very little thermal mass. Um, that's a hospital, OK? And it's completely air-conditioned. You can't even open a window. At least it's better than that one. Addenbrooke's Hospital. And you know, even that one I rather like. That, that, that would be a nice, heavy, concrete building with balconies, opening windows. A bit. John Radcliffe in, in Oxford is, again, all opening windows on a greenfield site. How much better to get that? Because, of course, I don't know if any of you specialize in hospitals. Has anyone done any work on the transmission of nosocomial infections between wards? I mean, what you do is you put nice little ducts between one ward to the next ward to the next ward. <laughs> and I mean, these, these were the, the clinics of the, the 20th century. Um, fresh air, sunlight. A bacillus in that sunlight there will die within five hours of solar exposure or something. Um, fresh air and ventilation, and Rod Eskom at Imperial's done a huge amount of work on that. Um, it actually, it's much more healthy to have huge opening windows in a TB hospital in Peru than it is to, to shut them off. Because that, and yet we're, we're persuaded um, against that sort of thing. Okay, so let, let's just look at it in terms of the evolution of building types. Passive house, 1990s, energy efficiency, insulation, good windows, airtight, no thermal bridging, heat recovery. It has an overheating problem, and it's not suitable for many climates. There is a fallacy about efficiency, yeah? And this is the difference between efficiency and sufficiency. So this one, I think, is... Um, this is a typical, this is Bill Bordess's work, typical prestige, big air-conditioned building. And I think this is the Gherkin, and it's sold as the most energy-efficient office block in London, but it's energy-efficient of its type, yeah? And a good practice, naturally ventilated, you know, office block in central Cambridge will be a fraction of that, yeah? So it's not about efficiency, it's about sufficiency. Yeah, what is sufficient energy to do the work you need to do in an office? Okay, so that was the 90s. Let's get on to the noughties. We suddenly all discovered sustainability. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if anybody else is as confused as I was about it, having written books and chapters on it, because sustainability was, ooh, a great big basket full of things and water and health, community type stuff like that. And I, th I think we'd sort of lost an almost a, a decade getting confused. But we, what we did get out of it is these rating tools, which are very sort of strict rating tools, largely funded and developed by developers and people like the BRE. This is the Green Sustainable um, Housing Rating Tool, where the energy is the biggest... Um, section of it, you get 18.8 .8 points, and you get 2.5 points for reduced fabric heat loss, which is like the quality of the envelope, 2.5 points for an energy efficient external lighting, 2.5 points for a cycle store, 25 quid cycle rack, 15 quid light bulb. They did Briam too, which is a huge number of Really, and then they charge them vast amounts to Briam rate it, and then you get chronically overheating buildings like the um, Camden New Town, all they've moved into, and they can't can't breathe in it. 
Okay, Naughties did up the game a bit. We got sustainability. We got Active House from Denmark, which was um, um, a lot more. It's comfort, energy, environment, and we got Passive House. We but they widened the envelope. A lot of thermal storage, natural ventilation, ap adaptive envelopes, active solar systems, um, but still often the overheating problem. Okay, we have now resilience. That's the teens. That's where we largely are now. We're beginning to get a taste that climate change is going to be um, really, really challenging. And, I mean, you saw this latest report that says that by 2100, sea level rises won't be one meter as predicted. They'll be two meters. So um, you've seen the rates of melt on the Himalayas, you've seen the rates of, I mean, but also this overheating thing, which is the one I'm concentrating on. I think we need to future-proof and make climate ready. I think we really have to take solar energy with storage as, as a building level. That's going to really hugely help in a number of ways. But we also have to understand adaptive opportunities and controls and we have to see people as part of the solution. People aren't the problem. You know, when buildings fail, everybody says, oh, it's the occupants, they didn't know how to use it, they don't know how to open a window, they don't know. No, it's badly designed. You know, people aren't stupid, even in social housing. So that's resilience, okay? I reckon we're going into the next phase. <coughs> we're going into the 20s now. We've had the noughties, we've had the teens, we're going into the 20s. And this is where I think adaptive design is going to be absolutely critical. Now, how does this affect you? Because I think it affects all of you, your children, your families. How do you design an adaptive building? Now, look, I, I'm talking to architects here, but really I should be talking to architectural students too. Um, you don't start like that. You do not start in front of a computer and expect to get the right answer because computers and modeling and simulation does not, do not give you the right answers now, often. I think you start with a piece of paper and a pencil and you work out. You see, look, it's very difficult. You work out what steps you've got to take. And here I'm proposing to you three different steps. What you have to do now is not see the building as simply a series of building system flows, you know, electricity and water and stuff like that. You have to reconnect so the building becomes part of the ecosystem. Yeah, so that is all of that ambient energy. The ideal is, as, as Bjorn Olesen, the successor to Olifanger in Denmark said, the future of buildings is that they will be run for as long of a day and a year as possible on free natural energy. And only when you need heating and cooling will you use it. And that's Bjorn Olesen, who's head at Danish Technical Institute, who run and invented PMV. So reconnect the building to what's around it. But I'm proposing here, and I'd be interested to hear what you say, a three-step design process. Number one, design the building that will be there for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. That's everything you can't change about a building. If you, We're in a building that's from 1762, was it? Yeah. You design what it's made of, the mass in it, the orientation, the holes in it, um, the height of the rooms. You design uh, the depth in the ground. You design structural overhangs and so on. Um, in that first step, that's where the mistakes are made or the battle is won or lost. Um, you can have... Now, I'm giving these examples. You can have a building like mine, which is a completely flat, this is my Oxford Eco House, 
is made largely of, of concrete in blocks inside, huge mass, and it has a completely stable thermal uh, temperature. So the, in the rooms, it's absolutely stable. You'll get something like a passive house, which might not be so bad, you know, so-so. And then you'll get a, a, built, a glass house, which will have a completely psychotic thermal heartbeat. I mean, it's like living in a greenhouse. Why would you design that? So it's a badly behaved, OK, badly behaved building. Behaved building. And here, I mean, in a well-behaved building, you've got very stable temperatures. That's my eco house. But why does that matter? It's because in a well-behaved building with a good level thermal heartbeat within that four degrees centigrade change for a room or something, you don't need any extra energy. If you've got a so-so building, you'll need more energy to stay within acceptable temperatures. And if you've got one of those really psychotic thermal pulses in a building, you need huge amounts of cooling and heating to keep it occupiable. That's part of it, but this is in Dammam in Saudi Arabia. And look at going north, you can see where the living room is south and west against the sun. So simply by locating a space in a, a sensible position, in that bedroom and the top one, you've got again, as soon as the sun hits it, the internal temperature, you're, you're going up 34 and so on. So the use of buffering spaces around it. So the planning of these spaces are really important. And here, the same thing, you know, um, this is north here. So that central living room is a fairly well-controlled, isolated space. Um, whereas as soon as the sun gets onto that bedroom, and trust me, in these extended families in the Gulf, if you don't like your mother-in-law, <laughs> and you're living in a pink bedroom, you've got problems. It's a moral in that, isn't there? But here's something with me on this one either is that one of the real killers, this is Australia, I did a study on the Adelaide heat wave, 2014, really, two, I think about 2,000 people died in that one, that in a living room where you've got this big, you know, kitchen living room, one great big space here, and you've got the um, west-facing walls there, there is no way you can get away from that heat. You know, so... The idea of this gracious living in, in a very, very large space. I mean, and yet it's, it's the sort of icon of modern buildings. I was, I was um, one of the three judges on the best building in Scotland a couple of years ago. And all of the modern homes are just like that. The kitchen, dining room, sitting room in one vast space with a wall of glass facing west. Well it's going to be jolly difficult, that sort of design. And um, so this, this idea that thermally is very difficult to deal with that. And so it might be eight months of the year, it's perfectly fine. You might have two cold months, two hot months. So you provide somewhere else for that. I mean, why would anyone design a research building? This is the Blavatnik in Oxford. Completely fixed windows circular glass building and just think of the energy needed and they say oh but we've got a really efficient system and here and uh, you know again for you architects this is a problem you've got student halls of residence you've got student rooms and they're putting in a third of the wall of glazing so what do they do they put one strip there of glazing as opposed to a third of the walls sideways that would light a work surface and meant they can run around in their bedrooms in their knickers and, you know, get up to be messy and all of that. No, it has to go that way. And your knees can't actually enjoy the view. You know, um, and yet this is an endemic fault in modern architecture. Um, and it leads to over... So what do people do? They lower the blinds, don't they? But every single 
modern um, hall of residence does that. It's extraordinary. Anyway, let's look at an adaptive house. This is Nortje Olders from the Netherlands. She's taking an ordinary little terraced house and, you know, many of us, okay, yeah, live in them and she's just making it two-sided. So you've got the warm side and the cool side. And so in extremis, you can, um, you know, use one for winter, but you've got a, a, a summer, a winter retreat or a summer retreat. And then she's got really effective dumping of heat. And, um, but this is something I really think I'm working on with my life. For the, the elderly who die first, usually, every home should have a little thermal retreat for summer so they don't die in their own rooms. And also for winter too. Um, so what I call climate refuges for extremists. So that was the first level. That's the basic building. The second level is all the things you can change about a building. It's the adaptive opportunities. Things will have been changed with the lights, the boiler, the window glazing, the levels of insulation. You can change all that. That's a secondary thing, the mechanical stuff. Um, and here's Norcher's, um terraced house, her adaptive terraced house, and she showed that she could run it on 80% less energy simply by using her range of strategies. Why does this matter? Because so many HVAC engineers, if you take a so-so building, only know how to put in a mechanical solution. They're not taught about how to calculate the mass, generally how to calculate the natural ventilation. If the architects took more responsibility from an early stage, and provided really good passive heating, cooling, shutters, you know, adaptive opportunities, a lot of passive ones, then the mechanical heating and cooling solutions could be absolutely minimized. And then we get to the top note, which is the architecture thing. And this is what I call the wow to wow. And many, many young architects go out of schools of architecture thinking that their function in life is to create wow moments. Um, you, and the, the sort of spiritual well-being right now, I mean, you, you imagine coming home, hello, dear, I've got your big red plastic puff all ready for you to sit on it and have a look out the window. You know, or the Google thing. This is designed to keep you frenetically uh, producing adrenaline so you can work 14 hours a day. So there are two types of comfort. There's one, which is the um, comfort down a duct in a bottle from a machine. And there's the other one, which is um, probably what you should be designing for. So how do you design a comfortable building? You give it a very well-behaved thermal-based pulse, yeah, or rooms in it anyway. You provide lots of adaptive opportunities and you put a lot of um, well-being um, features in it. I'm not going to go through this um, except to say that this is, this, this is my house here which has a very stable internal temperature but it's you know the first level of it is the, the, the um, harvesting the microclimates, hot microclimates on one side, cold on the other. Because, yeah, because I, um, you see, um, I'll show you here, is that in this sun space, this is a sun space here with a wall over there, a roof over there, and all the French windows are internally, so um, um, I, there's no direct sunshine in, and there's no windows in the west facing wall. I, I spent 10 years in Iran and Iraq. And also, another thing is that, you know, if you're putting solar on your roof, that can also shelter your roof from incoming radiation too. Uh, and um, that, that roof was the first solar roof in Britain. And this is last week, which wasn't that hot. And I'm generating, this is 24-year-old solar PV roof. And that's generating 19 kilowatt hours, of which I use about half a kilowatt hour. And, um, but this is really the, the final and the important thing for all of you now 
is this issue of shade. As it gets hotter and hotter, you have your windows. And the first lesson is that once that, it's, it's like the um, greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. Once that solar radiation gets through the glass, it hits a surface and will change from, say, 500 nanometers. It hits a f surface and re-radiates back out at longer wave radiation. It can no longer get back through the glass. So if you've got a blind on the inside of your glass, you've got the heat inside anyway. You, you might get some, but... Yeah? And now look, even in my eco pergolas, shade it with um, vines against the wall, shade it with um, lots of different features. But what I would like to say to you too is in your own homes, um, for your... Uh, or your children's homes or your friends' homes, there's loads and loads of amazing shades on the market. And you can, uh, and they're not expensive, some of them. You know, some of them obviously are. But for instance, this one here, um, with these stretch out ones that you can shade a whole sort of patio area or stuff like that, because it's not only the window you have to shade, you have to shade the wall to, to keep that cool. Um, Five, um, heat wave, 1,000 people died, mainly elderly, and many of them were found dead in their rooms when they broke into them because they locked the door and they had the windows shut because they were afraid of being robbed. Because um, if they'd opened the doors, so, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, oh, think about these, um, and there's some lovely, you know, get your grills in. If, if you're worried about opening the window because you've got a security issue, deal with it. This is what they do in Japan. They've got these wonderful different grill types. Um, and lots of sliding different shades and shutters and so on for winter and summer using stack. If you, even a V-Lux in your roof, right? If you open that above a stairwell, that will mean that you can dump heat upwards very, very efficiently. Um, so get your shading right, get your security grills in place, get your window opening right, and also start to manage those, um, your microclimates around the building. So you've got to know, like, like here, you know, you're gonna have a, a cool or a cool garden, yeah? Grow your plants up and grow the gardens around where you want to source your air from. So you precondition the air moving through buildings. Um, 60% re-radiation can bounce off that back into the window. So you're getting 160%. And so you're, you're it's absolutely deal with that and understand those heat flows going through. And... You know, in winter, you'll want that heat for free heating because if you've got a south-facing house in winter, you're probably only um, using two-thirds of the energy to heat it than if you've got a north-facing house. So that's very useful in winter. So you, your whole house is surrounded by this free energy. You just have to learn how to understand its benefits and harvest it. And you, you watch, you know, thousands will die in France and in Spain. And this is why I think also if we learn as designers those solutions in relation to our own lives and our own flats, you'll never make that design mistake again anywhere else, will you? Um, so just as um, what I'm doing now is, is now looking at, I've gone beyond resilience, I'm looking at extreme design. And this is, we had a big conference in Dubai a couple of weeks ago. Oh, sorry, no, April it was, sorry. Um, on comfort at the extremes. And if you want to follow any of the papers from there, they're absolutely amazing set of papers that the epidemiologists, the um, architects, the material scientists, the physiologists coming together and just sort of saying, Arr! We need to, to think about this. And this is what I've just been doing recently. Um, I'm looking at designing extreme structures. So this is one we've just put up 
February in Antarctica, um, based on a, um, a yurt but with really innovative materials. And if, if you want extremelodge.org, we're going back next February to see if it's withstood 12 months in 200 kilometer an hour winds in the extreme cold. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because we are all of us, and I've lived in some extraordinary places in deserts and with nomads and stuff like that, we don't know our own limits until we go beyond them and look back. And um, what I found there, and I was there with two Portuguese colleagues um, in this remote site in Collins Glacier, was that we were working in this design beyond the limits of our knowledge, but also beyond the limits of our imagination. And so by doing it, you suddenly open a new world into what extreme design might mean. And I hate to say it, but it is coming. And this is why it's important for each of us to future-proof ourselves. And when your children or your friends or you go to buy your new house, you know the first thing you have to do is look at what the basic building is. Is it What's the character of that building? Is it a well-behaved building? And um, is, it, is it one that's going to um, be a friend to you for the rest of your life there? Or is it going to be something that you're continually having to cope with? And if it is, start to manage it with those second level adaptive options and um, then, uh, then you can start to overlay it with those beautiful points of walking into rooms and seeing things that please you and lift your spirit and so on. But part of well-being is being feeling safe in your own home and secure and so just deal with those first and then that will give you the comfort to be happy in your own home. Anyway, I hope that was interesting. <laughs>